Welcome to session eight. In the last session, we talked about how prices can be adjusted to individuals' consumers' willingness to pay. We talked about price discrimination, price bundling, and we also talked about how consumers perceive prices, consumer perceived value, as well as the whole concept of sales promotion versus everyday low price. One thing we implicitly assumed in the past two sections was that the firm can set the price however they want as a function of the customer's willingness to pay. But in most real life situations, firms will face a series of constraints in setting prices. And today I want to talk about the three most important constraints. The first one will be cost. The second will be how to interact within a competitive environment. And the third, which factors to consider when you do pricing in the context of a larger distribution channel. Let's start with cost first. And in order to do this, let's take the example of Chateau Margaux. You probably know that Chateau Margaux is a very, very famous brand of French Bordeaux wine. Chateau Margaux used to have a premium wine, which is called the first wine. And over the years, Chateau Margaux realized that this premium wine became more and more selective in order to achieve a higher and higher quality, and that more and more grapes didn't make the cut. So at some point, they introduced a second wine in order to make use of the leftover grapes. However, over time, also the second time became more and more selective. So in 2013, Chateau Margaux was faced with the decision of introducing a third wine labeled under the brand Margaux to Chateau Margaux to make use of the ever increasing amount of leftover grapes for the first and second wine that up to this point, they simply sold in bulk to other wine producers. Assume you are the CMO of Chateau Margaux and you need to decide which costs to consider in pricing this third wine, Marco de Chateau Margaux. The key factor in this context is that not all costs are always relevant to pricing because you have to identify the true cost. And the first question here is incremental versus full cost. In the example of Chateau Margaux, you can only include incremental cost. Incremental costs are the costs that come and go when the product comes and goes. For example, bottling cost, because the third wine will need to have bottles, so you may need to buy bottles, buy labels, probably design labels, put the wine into those bottles. These costs only occur because the new product is introduced. Another example are opportunity cost. If you bottle the wine, then you can no longer sell the grapes to another wine producer in bulk, and this lost revenue is also a kind of incremental cost. However, anything else that is there anyway, like the cost for your building, your overhead cost, general marketing expenditure should not be included because they are not incremental cost. In addition, you should only include what is called avoidable cost, cost that are directly associated with decisions that you can change, not sunk costs, which are costs which are associated with decisions made in the past. And I make this a little bit more clearer, this distinction in a couple of minutes. So if you have a product price of $2.50 and the incremental cost, I repeat, the cost that come and go when the product comes and goes is 50 cents, you take that off, you come to the contribution margin of $2. Now the contribution margin is not the same as the product profitability because the difference between both are all the other costs. In our example here, 125, which gives us a product profitability of 75 cents. Obviously, this raises the question which costs are incremental and which ones are not. Variable costs are usually always incremental because, by definition, variable costs depend on the amount of production of a certain new product. However, you need to be very careful of using averages because the incremental variable cost may not necessarily be the same as the average variable cost. Assume, for example, that Chateau Margaux's bottling factory is already at total capacity. So in order to bottle the third wine, they need to introduce a night shift and assume that the night shift is more expensive because you have to pay the workers more. This overtime is more expensive than the average cost and hence the incremental bottling cost for the third wine are larger than the average bottling cost. The same I apply when the new product is targeted to a different type of consumer. For example, if the new wine were targeted to a type of consumer that is more complicated to reach, that requires more extensive marketing or different types of marketing, 
then these higher marketing costs would need to be included and you cannot simply work with the average cost for the average consumer. Some fixed costs are also incremental, for example, the fixed cost with introducing the new product, the market research campaign that you have to do in order to decide how to design the product, the designer you have to pay in order to design the label, for example, but most of them are not because fixed costs do not really change, usually when something comes and goes. Product development costs very generally are fixed costs and you usually would not include them. Advertising, if it's about general brand building, is the same thing. Something that is important is to not overlook opportunity cost. Go back a slide. You remember that I talked about the opportunity cost of bulk sales. The alternative course of action that you can take <coughs> if you do not introduce the new product may bring you incremental revenue. And this needs to be included as an incremental cost when this revenue doesn't occur. One thing that you may wonder right now is, why do we even care about this concept of contribution margin? Again, as I explained some slides back, you take the price per unit minus the incremental cost and you come to the contribution margin. Or you take the total revenue minus the total variable cost and you come to the total contribution. Why do we even bother about contribution margins? Why don't we simply use product profitability as a key measure? Well, there are three factors where contribution margin plays an important role. First, Contribution margin gives you a sense of your competitive advantage. The higher your contribution margin, the more money you can spend to fight off competitors. It also gives you a tool for segmentation pricing because when you have a very high contribution margin, you can lower the price more considerably for some customers whose willingness to pay may be lower. And overall, this gives you a sense of how you can best increase profit. For high margin products, you may wanna increase volume, for low margin products, you probably may try to raise prices or use price bundling to bundle them with other high margin products. One factor that usually leads to a lot of confusion is this idea of sunk cost. So in order to explain this, let me use the example of end of season sales. Assume you're a sporting goods store that purchased running shoes for $31 a pair in spring and you sold them during the summer for $50 a pair, which means you made $29, $19 profit per pair. However, in fall, you are left with run, the run, demand for running shoes declined and you are left with 50 pairs. Now you have two choices. Choice one is that you discount the shoes to $29.99 in order to get rid of those 50 pairs. Option two <clears throat> is that you put those shoes into storage, wait for next year, and then try to sell them next year for $39.99. You have to have a price of $29.99 when you want to sell them now because people would expect some kind of discount to the regular price of $31 and, and for $50. And next year, you will not be able to sell them anymore at $50 because it will be old shoes. <coughs> Please pause the video for a second and think a little bit which option would be preferable in your view. In order to take the decision, you need to identify the incremental cost that you occur. The first thing that you need to see is that the $31, the purchase cost, are entirely irrelevant for that decision. For many people, the intuitive choice could be that they do not want to sell the shoes for $29.99 now if they have purchased them for $31, because that would mean they made a loss of $1 per shoe. But this cost of $31 cannot be recovered anymore anyway. You paid that money, the shoes are yours. The fact that you paid probably too much for them is a decision in the past that cannot be reversed. These purchase costs are a classical example of sunk cost and they should not be considered in this decision. Instead, you should consider the decision of what is the incremental cost and incremental profit of putting the shoes into storage versus selling them now. Well, for example, you may need to insure the shoes. If you assume 1% per month, a $2.40 a pair, for example, you, you get a certain amount of money. You need to probably rent space in order to put the shoes. You may need to have to pay a person to put the shoes into storage. Assume that all of this together costs you about $9.40. Of course, this depends a lot on the specific type of assumptions you take. Now, if we wait, if you put these shoes into storage, we earn $10 more versus selling the shoes now. $39.99 versus 
but we also have incremental costs of $9.40, which means the actual difference is only 60 cents. And probably a difference of 60 cents per shoe would not justify the decision to wait. And this is the reason why considering sunk cost is so important, because if you make a right calculation of incremental cost and incremental revenue, you will see that putting the shoes on sales is the best decision, even if technically speaking, you start losing money on those shoes because you have to sell them cheaper than what you actually paid for. Another point to consider when we talk about cost is the whole concept of financial analysis. Financial analysis and the goal of financial analysis is to understand the trade-off between price and volume. Usually for most products, when the price goes down, volumes go up. When products get cheaper, people tend to buy more of them. There are some exceptions and mostly products where the price itself is a main reason for people to buy the product. Think of last section when I talked about customer perceived value, some luxury products are bought in order to get social status. And for those luxury products, the fact that they are expensive is an important product component itself. But for most product, volume would go up if price goes down. So if we discount a product, for example, in the context of a sales promotion, we need to understand how much volume will increase in return in order to get a sense of how much more money we make. And this is the idea of financial analysis. Take the following example. Assume we have a product that is currently sold for $10 and where we currently sell 1,000 units. So our total profit that we currently make, our total revenue is in the following graph, A plus B plus D. Now assume we decrease price by 10%. So we go from P0, which is $10, down to P1, which is $9. The con total contribution that we make at the old price is A plus B because D is our variable cost that we have to take away. If we decrease price by 10%, B remains the same, but A gets replaced by C because A disappears. And instead we hopefully have a volume increase that translates into C, which is an incremental profit. Now you can easily calculate that break even is given when A is equal to C. And you know that A is 1,000 times 10 minus 9, which is 1,000, and the break-even sales is therefore 500. What this tells you is that if you decrease price by 10% from $10 to $9, in order to break even, this means in order to make the same profit that you made before, sales would need to go up by 50% from 1,000 to 1,500 1, units. This is an enormous sales increase. And this is something you need to consider when you run price promotions, because if sales do not increase by that much, you will necessarily lose money on the promotion. Now, what we just explained in the form of a graph, you can very easily put into an equation. The break-even sales change is the change in sales that is necessary to maintain the same total level of contribution when the price changes. And you can easily calculate it by taking the initial sales volume, which is 1,000 in our case, times the absolute price change, 10 minus 9, divided by the new contribution margin. And in the next section, we talk about competition and how prices are impacted not only by what you want to do, but also what your competitors want to do.